Well, welcome everyone and Happy New Year. Hong Xi Fat Hai, as we'll all be saying many times these few weeks. And I, I found it interesting that in the year of the horse, um, every year there's some new saying everyone says, and the one they're saying about the horse is Ma Shang Zhuan Tian, which has a double entendre, and it means um, to uh, earn money on the back of the horse, but it also means to earn money really quickly. So uh, I think you'll see what we're talking about today uh, is very much involved with holding the money that's being earned in China. Um, what we're going to do, me with my, my dream team partners here, uh, I'm really thrilled that uh, Alan and Ron were, uh, were, were willing to join me up here. We're going to give you a bit of an overview from our own perspectives. Uh, I'll talk about the big picture with socioeconomic and political changes. Alan will talk to you about the consumer and how they are consuming. And then Ron will give us some case illustrations of contemporary Chinese consumption behavior. And the topic is very timely, especially for any of you that have read the latest issue of The Economist, which came out Friday, uh, which said that the future of the world will be profoundly shaped by China's rush toward consumerism. Uh, and each of us started watching and getting involved in China at different stages. But I know for me, in the mid-90s, when uh, while working for Kodak, where of course there was lots of consumption of film, uh, we started looking at what people were consuming. People would talk about the three bigs back then, San Da Jian. And if you look back to the cycle of the three bigs, back in the 60s when you were talking about a planned socialist economy, there were three things every household wanted, a bicycle, a sewing machine, and a wristwatch. In the, that was the 60s and 70s. In the 80s, it was a color TV, a fridge, and a washing machine. And actually, you know, until reform in the late 80s, it was very hard to supply everybody with all of those things, even if they were all able to buy them at the same time. Then as you got into the early 90s, uh, it changed to a phone, an air conditioner, and a VCR. And sometime through that decade, family modernization was essentially completed. Most households had all essential items, and the choice of what you had to buy really expanded. So it was no longer just the three things. So then you saw it expanding into lists of four or five, including things like microwaves or cell phones. Now that's completely gone away. Um, you know, the whole market has just evolved. In fact, there's really only one big thing people talk about these days, and that's an apartment. If you are a guy and you don't have one, no self-respecting woman will marry you. So it might be the one big, actually. Um, and so really what happened over the course of these 30 years of reform is that you, know, you could term it an economic miracle. Um, I have been talking since about 2008 about the number of 400 million people brought out of poverty. Uh, a report by the Wharton School recently actually cites it as 680 million people uh, between 1980 and 2010 brought out of poverty. And what came with that was double-digit economic growth um, and China becoming an export engine and a factory to the world. Uh, so that export-led growth really helped China build this engine. And there was also investment-led growth. Any of you who have been to China versus, say, India can see the changes in the infrastructure development that have happened that have been driven by that government uh, investment. And particularly in 2008 when the financial crisis hit, China really revved up its investment growth um, plan so that it could keep growing uh, while a lot of other countries were struggling. And of course, its markets like the US for its exports were not growing. So the investment-led growth has been driving things for the last few years. And what China knows is that this is not sustainable. Uh, it, it, it can keep growing at the rates it needs to keep everyone employed and happy and not protesting uh, unless some things change, including people starting to consume more. Uh, and in a book by a guy, Jim McGregor, called No Ancient Wisdom, No Followers, uh, he talks about these consumption rates. Chinese consumption is at 35% of GDP. This is about half of what it is in the U.S. In the U.S., Canada being quite similar, 71% of GDP goes to consumption. In Brazil, it's 63%. Even in India, it's 54%. At the same time in China, only 38% of government spending goes to education, healthcare, and social security. And that's something like 16 percentage points lower than developing countries of comparable income levels. So if you're somebody living in China, and you know that the government isn't going to provide for your education, your healthcare, and your social security, you're saving a lot. That's why those rates are so low. Um, so that, this is why China knows it needs to do quite a few things to get people to start to consume more. At the same time, China is trying to avoid something called the middle income trap, where 
Uh, in that same Wharton study, they describe uh, this is when a country basically gets stuck in a rut, unable to compete with low-cost countries, but without the technology sophistication to compete with innovation-led economies. And so there are quite a few countries that have gotten stuck in that middle-income trap. Three that didn't, uh, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, were able to replace their investment-led growth with domestic consumption. Um, but those countries' investment as a percent of GDP maxed out at about 35%, whereas China's is currently 50%. So that makes it that much more challenging for them. Now, China has in place a new leadership, Xi Jinping the president, and Liu Keqiang the premier. <coughs> they know that there are lots of challenges ahead. And uh, in the year or so that they've been in power, they've been making their plans for reform quite clear. And in November, during the third cleanup meetings, uh, a, a, a template for reform came out. And there are quite a few things listed as challenges that impact how people consume. Um, some of it, we've just talked about the unbalanced economic growth. You've got shortcomings in education, healthcare, and social security, and housing. Food, drug, and workplace safety. If you're not sure that your food is going to be safe, you're going to consume in a different way, uh, creating a market for imported foods, for example. Environmental degradation. There's a big market these days for air purifiers in Beijing, for example, as well for people who want to get away and go to places where the air is clean. And then the urban-rural income gap. And so this is one where urbanization can be one of the keys to helping to drive more consumption and to changing the economic model. Um, right now, just over 50% of people live in cities. That's expected to go to 70% by 2030. And so uh, turning uh, rural dwellers into urban dwellers <coughs> is a key economic growth engine. And the problem is, even now, where you have lots of people in the cities, 700 million Chinese, about 300 million of them don't have what's called an urban hukou, a residence permit that gives them all the rights to live in that city, which means they have limited access to schools, to hospitals, and to pensions. So these migrants save every penny they make. If you can get them proper status, proper hukou, in those cities, they then can start to spend more. And so the need to make migrants true urban citizens is a huge priority for the government right now. In fact, Jim McGregor cites in his book that if 10 million migrants can become urban citizens each year, they will form a potential new global market of unprecedented size. Um, and it could amount to a, a, an additional 1% added to GDP each year, which is very important. Um, so what you can see is that consumption right now is something that's in service of government goals. And at CCBC, the organization I run, we often tell companies that if they want to approach China as a market, they have to, they have to decide whether or not their offering is in line with the goals of the country, and in many cases, the goals of the government. Um, so if the government still pulls the strings. Every once in a while, you see some interesting intervention, like uh, a few months ago, the media came out with criticism of Starbucks for selling its $5 lattes. Um, they moved next to a mall in Beijing where the Starbucks chairs were all filled with people drinking $5 lattes, taking their dates there, going there on their coffee breaks. And if they didn't want to pay $5 for a latte, there was a place with perfectly fine cappuccino in the basement for $2. No one was forcing them to pay $5 for that. Um, you'll also see another area where the government has an influence. If we were sitting here 18 months ago, we would talk about what a great market China is for high-end spirits, the Mao Thai brand in China, ice wine from Canada. And now with the government crackdown on corruption and official gift giving, many of that, much of that dynamic has changed. So it's important to know that there is that element uh, in the environment. But I think we can say that in terms of consumption, the genie is pretty much out of the form. Once people are used to having choice and access to products, it's pretty hard to tell them that they can't. Uh, and so we'll focus for the rest of the time on really what does that look like. So I'll turn it over to Alan to talk about the consumer. <coughs> and it's going to follow the same theme. Uh, number one, I'm an optimist for China. Uh, we train a lot of their leaders, and I'm extremely impressed by them. Number two, optimism for growth. But part of what Sarah was talking about, which is there are signs of some moderation going on. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk under what I call the six C's of understanding consumption. The country, the culture, the consumer, consumption itself, the Chinese dream, just a quick note on that, and most important, communication. Let's talk about the country. Um, you know, who are these, these groups? Um, Sarah talked about McGregor. Put some numbers. 
definition by various groups earning the equivalent of 34,000 or more, um, you've got about 3% of the population which is going to grow to about 9% of the population in, in the next three years. What well, they call up a middle um, 16,000 to roughly 35,000 will grow to 54% of the population within three years. <coughs> so you've got the new rich and the new aristocracy. Your, your menus uh, your, on, the, on the table talked about the number of billionaires. What's even more interesting, I think, is that 8% of all billionaires in the world now live in China. Now, with the population proportion, you expect that to go higher. Watch that growth. So you've got very large uh, groups of people who are spending on what we're all thinking about, which is luxury goods. A little more about that in a minute. However, because of what's the cost, particularly of apartments in the major cities, and it's not just Beijing, Shanghai, but also Chongqing, Wuhan, Chengdu, you've now got what is an estimated 30% of families spending half their income in debt interest. Either paying back loans from the banks, loans on the mortgages, loans on the car, and loans on the credit card. So you've got very much a, a, a split pack. You've got that rich, you've got that overall increase in consumption. But there is a pressure there to spend, and the credit is being delivered. Um, the new, two new luxury <coughs> goods are going down, partly because of the government clampdowns on the gifts, but there's still a healthy market. There's a new sector, two new sectors. One is called cheap and good enough. And the second is luxury second hand. There are now stores, one of the fastest growing store chains in, in China, sell second hand luxury goods you know, as a way of um, getting the income going but also moving stuff out um, from the gift giving environment. What do people want? Yeah, you've still got the rights of passage. Um, in my advertising career, Tobias Diamond was one of my clients. We used to love Japan, we love China right now. Uh, China, you don't even talk about a quarter carat. Starts a half and goes up from there. Uh, but that's part of rights of passage. Cars are rights of passage. Do you go to Beijing and Shanghai now and you think the traffic's bad? Wait for another year or two. See what will happen. Gift giving is the big effect of what's happening in Xi Jinping's taking power back from the, uh, across the breadth of the party, but also some of the municipalities and regional governments, and really clamping down um, on overseas tours, what you're allowed to give, you know, and the way they'll do it is shaming. And you, you'll have every so often certain very high profile people who up to a certain point have been successful, you'll see read all over the media. Um, that they're being challenged, so you watch that. I'm going to come back to e-commerce, because e-commerce may be one of the areas that we don't assume is as successful as it is. I'm going to come back to that. Only 45% internet penetration, but I'll give you some more numbers in there. Financing. Financing is a fascinating area, because you've got the shadow of a financial economy. Uh, because of the regulations in the banking sector, and because of the government encouragement to consumption, you've got a shadow bank um, organization. Alibaba has uh, an organization called AllPay, which is a third-party payment network that guarantees small, medium enterprises goods. What they're doing essentially is guaranteeing the funding of loans to consumers to buy things. And it's becoming an enormous funding system. There's bank reform just being proposed to let them push back at that, but you've got a bit of a competition going on in the financial sector to get money out uh, into the consumption. There, you'll read several uh, uh, phrases about China. One is space tracks, sp space strapped, which means don't make it a big package. If you want to sell, make the IKEA now has a whole range of products, all at smaller sizes than they offer in uh, the European, particularly the North American outlets, because they've got to fit in, in smaller um, environments. So yes, that, that push for um, ownership or, or being able to move into an apartment or a home, but it's relatively smaller. Sarah mentioned you've got huge pollution problems. Um, those of you who travel there know this. And it's interesting that the Chinese dream which much, many people talk about, includes, I had a quote, 
safe food, air, water, and vibrant living. I'm not sure many people living right now in Beijing uh, would automatically agree with that. So let me end my mind a little bit by talking about communication. It's the third largest advertising market in the world, and it's about to overtake Japan and become the second largest advertising market in the world. Um, of the $41 billion spent on advertising, uh, about $26 billion uh, this year will go on the internet. There are 800 million mobile subscribers, 500 million on the internet, 250 million microbloggers. The interesting thing about this is how the news gets around about goods, about political movements. One of my <coughs> training programs last year at the Communist Party middle range um, from Shanghai in town. And a rather, some rather scurrilous things have happened to a couple of very high profile politicians. And here's the head of the delegation who's a party member translating for me all the scurrilous things going around on their internet site about so And basically you'll say, yeah, this guy's an idiot. Not surprising this didn't work because look at his track record. So you've got that kind of information going around. And you have Tencent seem to own a large chunk of uh, different pieces of communication including WeChat. And WeChat's already at 100 million. And it is the most protected of the networks of information getting out. Now, it's not totally up listened to, but firewall access to that and what you say is, is, is much less than going on some of the other areas, like QQ and QZone and the guys. So, where does all this link to the culture? It's always interesting watching China like some other countries, but not many, with the speed of transition. Um, I first went there in 1985. It was still blue suits. And it was still bicycles riding around. Uh, now it's Mercedes, BMWs, and, and all the rest of the stuff we talked about. How's that fitting? How's the traditional client China working with the new China? Well, there are some generalizations. Having to make before I hand over to Ron for a case of prison. <coughs> Somewhat fatalistic, a rather cyclical view of history and time and space. Morally relativistic, you know, it's not about right and wrong, but it's about what, what works at a particular point in time. But the big difference for most people in this audience, and most people in the West, especially if you come from North America, is the notion of family relative to individual. Because to understand how the pattern of consumption or working, you need to think in family terms. Now, are the millennials, yes, they, they're equivalent there as well, beginning to change some of them? Uh, China's quotations. Leaking goose gets shot down. Yeah. I lived in Japan for three years, the, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. It's amazing how many similarities you get there. But you've got huge experiment experimentalism amongst you. Dripping water pierces a stone, a saw made of rope cut through water. This notion of gradualism. But if you see which large chunks of those 700 million who live in seven cities, People, especially those who may be extra privileged because they're party kids, getting things quicker, your patience gets a little less. So, a bit of a push on, on that part of the culture. The contemporary consumerism, we talked a lot in, in our histories about it's all about status, it's all about the way you're seen. Well, if you're now a high profile person and people are worried about where you're getting your money, you might want to be a little more subtle about how you show off your consumerism. So is, wearing your watch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> is the badge value still there? But yes, it, we, we may be looking at a time when it's going to be moderated. So if those sound contradictory, yeah, welcome to China. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alan. And uh, good afternoon. It's always exciting to talk about the <laughs> impact of this growth of wealth in China. Because I think it is probably the most exciting and challenging market in the world. But this is not an academic exercise. You're not hearing about some country on the other side of the world. What I'm going to talk to you about is, if you think you felt the impact of China, you ain't seen nothing yet. 
they are going to have an incredible impact, and they are having an impact inside of China. But I'm going to talk to you about how their impact is going to now be felt globally. Now, I'm going to tell you at the end of my comments, we're going to ask for questions. So I just want to give you a warning here. We're going to ask some really challenging questions when I finish these points. I will pick on you. Okay, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about three things. We've been giving a lot of statistics to you, but I'm going to do a few more. First, I'm going to talk about how big is this army of Chinese that we're talking about here? How many of them actually have money to buy stuff? Then I'm going to talk to you about how they are dominating already some very visible categories, but not only in China, some luxury categories around the world. And then third, I'm going to talk about how this interesting new communication vehicle called the Internet, um, how the Chinese willingness to buy online is changing the face of retail and is going to change the face of retail for anyone that is in that industry. Okay, so let me start first of all with just how big is this army? And yeah, you'd like to hear in the press that they have um, all these billionaires. What's the number? They have 10% of the global billionaires. Okay, they also have 1,125,000 millionaires. By the way, that's four times as many billionaires as here in China and in Canada, and it's growing. But what about everybody else? Aren't they all poor? Well, I'm going to talk about a study done by the Boston Consulting Group. It's a large consulting firm that looked at what is the purchasing power in China. And usually a Chinese person will start buying Western goods, start buying an appliance, start buying a TV, when they earn about 60,000 renminbi per year. Now, you convert that with purchasing power parity, guys, think about it at 25,000 US dollars. So if you have $25,000 of income a year, you're going to start buying stuff. Now, as recently as 2005, we'll call these the aspiring class. In 2005, there were 11 million of these people in China. 11 million. It was about the number of people with this money in their pocket as Australia. By 2010, there were 50 million of these people. That's about the same number of people with 25 grand in their pocket as Japan. By 2020, which is a blink of an eye away, there's going to be 130 million people in China that are buying stuff. That's the number of aspiring households in the United States today. Okay, so this is growing incredibly fast. Now, what about this? Their purchasing power is already impacting categories. And I'll start with some you've all heard of. It's the second largest consumption economy in the world now, behind the U.S. Uh, $3.3 trillion. And you've all heard that they are the world's largest auto market. Right? There are more Lamborghini, Ferrari, and, and Daimler uh, dealerships in China than there are anywhere else in the world. There are more Apple stores in Shanghai than there are in San Francisco. They're the third largest luxury good buyers in the world. I mean, the Italians and the Americans still buy a bit more, but the Chinese are the third largest in this whole luxury handbag, luxury watch, luxury suit. Um, and the desirable brands, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, Gucci, Rolex, Tiffany, everything you would expect, and they're building half the shopping malls in the world right now. Now, interestingly enough, these guys are taking their purchasing habits on the road. Um, <laughs> Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a protocol in China. They say, you must tell your neighbors when you're going abroad and take an empty suitcase. Because they are really anxious to buy products. And let me give you some examples. Two-thirds of these luxury good purchases are actually now made outside of mainland China. Because by the time you take the product back and you pay duty and you pay taxes, frankly, it's more expensive to buy some of these luxury goods in Shanghai or Beijing. Okay? Um, here's an interesting one for a specific, you guys know Burberry, you know Burberry coats. Angela Aaron, the CEO of Burberry, will say 25% of the revenue is generated in China. But they actually believe they sell 40% of their products to the Chinese. Because they all buy it now in duty-free shops. They go to London, they go to Paris, they go to New York, and they mob the duty-free stores. So even the statistics in China are not enough. You know, they actually are travelers that we should be wooing more 
when they come to Canada. The Chinese are not only seeking luxury goods, they're seeking luxury travel, luxury hotels, luxury restaurants. Frankly, they're not that excited about adventure, they like acquisitions. And so they're looking for shopping malls. They're already, if you can believe this, the Chinese, it's only 15 years since outbound leisure travel was even allowed in China. My early days in Hong Kong, you couldn't bring people in and out. 15 years, they're already the world's largest travel spenders. The number is $11 billion last year, 40% bigger than the U.S. The Chinese are, and already it's a small group, but growing very quickly. Now, generally, they will reserve a third of their travel budget for acquisitions. And again, although the joke, standing joke is, they will buy merchandise with a label that says made in China. <laughs> but they're okay, because they say duties and taxes, and frankly, it's not a fake. We should be doing a lot more here in Canada to woo these foreign travelers with Mandarin speakers, with marketing. This is a huge opportunity. You know, Canada is not even in the top 20 destinations for the Chinese. New York is number 13. They don't see anything here in Canada. They go to Southeast Asia, they go to Taiwan. This is the world's largest travelers. With money to burn, we should be marketing today. Let's go on and talk about education. Education is a luxury. And if you talk to any Chinese family that has more than one million renminbi, that's roughly 120,000 US dollars, they will say they intend to buy foreign education for their child. In Canada, we have 200,000 foreign students in colleges and universities, 50,000 are Chinese, already a quarter, and they will grow. This is a luxury purchase that these newly wealthy Chinese families are gonna be pushing out. They're buying real estate. By real estate in Australia and in the US and in Canada. Here's a fact. London, England, last year, 27% of the real estate sold in London, England was sold to Chinese buyers. And in downtown London, where the houses are $8 million plus, it was 60%. And they paid cash. So think about the retail, the real estate implications of something like this. Um, in the U.S., they bought $12.5 billion for the property last year. And these guys are just starting. My third point is this online shopping. And Alan talked a bit about this. The fact that the Chinese are now embracing the Internet is changing retail. Let me explain why. Alan gave a couple of statistics, and these numbers change so quickly. China today is the world's largest Internet market, period. I've heard the number. It's $750 million now. 40% of the world's netizens live in China. The world's largest cell phone market, a billion cell phones, many of them are now smartphones, they're using this to access the internet. Chinese are, are already saying, why am I shopping in the local store? I can shop the country. I can shop the world. Amazon is shipping direct to China, but here's one that's even more impressive, Alibaba. Consider this as Amazon plus eBay plus PayPal rolled together in one. Started in 1999 by a young guy named Jack Ma. Last year they sold $12 billion worth of merchandise online. You could get everything from press toothpaste to consulting to capital goods. And Alipay, their subsidiary, will sell your bill in 12 different currencies. This is going to change the way retail operates, not only in the way they market to people, they encourage people to come, but in the way they process these transactions. So I have some conclusions like Alan does. I've already given you my number one, which is if you think the Chinese are, are you seeing them today? You ain't seen nothing yet. And I think that Canada, by, by policy now and by practice, needs to figure out how they now encourage more intersection with China and how they encourage them more, because financially, this matters to all of us.